even by the standards of the Trump era, I think this week has been particularly insane. Um, it's been an insane week. It's been an insane month. It's been an insane eight months. And one person we have not heard from this entire crazy time is Steve Schmidt, um, a lifelong Republican, a political operative and consultant. He became an outspoken never Trumper, an MSNBC Republican, if you will. He's been uh, he's been gone for around eight months. For some reasons you might know, some you might not. But he is back here tonight making his first return to MSNBC. Please welcome Steve Schmidt. How are you, man? Good to see you. How to see you. It's great to have you back. Great to be back. So you were working on a you were working for Howard Schultz. I was. Uh, who is a Starbucks CEO who toyed with uh, a, a run. Yeah. How, how was that? How'd that well, go? He, <laughs> he, um, he, as you know, he thought about being a candidate for president. He took a look at it closely. And in the end, he decided don't want to be a candidate for president. So I'm, I'm delighted to be back. <laughs> <laughs> That's what you've got to say about that? I do, yeah. Um, what has it been like to, uh, if not take a step back from the news, because I imagine you consume it, but just to watch the arc of the news and not be as sort of intimately involved in commenting on it? I think it gives you a little bit of a different perspective in that you're not talking about it three times, four times, five times a day, um, haven't tweeted in nine or ten months. And so... It, it's healthy to some level just to step back from from all of it. I mean, part of, I think, living in a democracy is freedom from the leader, the ubiquity of that the president constantly in your face. This is not something you see in normal democracies. We ought to have freedom from our politicians. They shouldn't be the central <laughs> figures in our in our lives in the all consuming and deeply worrying manner that they are. It's a, it's a really great point. I mean. There are many ways in which just to, I think, a core instinctual and visceral level, he really does have not just affection for strong men, but actually, like, likes that system, imagines himself as the head of it and has, in some ways, oriented our political culture around that vision. I I think one of the things, uh, there was a uh, trilogy of FDR uh, books that were completed by, and I'm blanking on on the author's name, but... He, he talked about the fact that FDR, as he was architecting the world that we live in today, and he said to the Canadian Prime Minister, Mackenzie King, he said that his ambition wasn't that this new world order, this American-led liberal global order, wasn't that it would last forever. He only wanted it to last for as long as every person who was alive on the day that the war ended was still alive. Mm. And it's had a good run. But you see this week in, in, in stark, stark ways the retreat and decline of American influence in the world. We see the ability of the Chinese culturally to impose silence on some of our most famous athletes, some of our most outspoken citizens. Um, we see the uh, filling of the Middle East with, with Russian influence as opposed to American. We see America's adversaries with license to move. We see chaos in the world. And so we've entered this consequences stage of the Trump presidency. And I think when we look at it, we should we should take very seriously uh, what the former head of the U.S. Special Operations Command, Admiral William McRaven, said. Uh, And he's not an indeliberate man. He said the republic is under attack from within by the president. So we're, we're moving into a very, very serious time in this country now. I want to talk about, you just mentioned the, what's going on in Syria, and, and I, I wanted to talk to you about that. There's, there's two things. One, it's really interesting to me to watch Republicans react to this, Lindsey Graham in particular, but a lot of them, because I think to myself, I'm like, this is a travesty and horrible, but this is the thing? This is the thing. Like, it wasn't the kids in cages. It wasn't the, you know, selling out American interests a million other ways or the rank corruption. It's this. This is the thing. And I, I almost can't model the ideological vision that makes this the breaking point. But I feel like you have a better sense. of Well, it. it's psychologically fascinating, the dissociation that you see playing out yeah, as yeah. if the silence and the acquiescence to the nonstop lying, to the corruption, to the incompetence that none of that accumulated to this moment, yeah. as if they have no responsibility for it. So he will have been elected three years ago. 
He has been president for a substantial period of time, and his behavior is getting worse because of the license that he's been given by members of the Congress right. who are who are a, members of a co-equal branch of government who have subordinated these institutions to the strongman president, who, as Admiral McRaven, I think correctly and appropriately said, is a real threat to the republic. There's um, there is some talk about, you know, there was a, a bipartisan vote in the House uh, uh, condemning the, the, the Syria policy. There might be one in the Senate. I guess I wonder, d- does it matter more than this issue? Right. Like there's some line of argumentation that you can see Republican senators start to get freaked out about the very durability of the country's interests being vouchsafed by the man in charge of it that might make them more open or, or more willing to break with Trump on other things. But do you think that work, that is true? Well, we haven't seen it so far. This is, this is the first instance because the incompetence of the decision and the consequences of that decision. We have hundreds of ISIS fighters have escaped from prison. Uh, they're not going to go to community college. No. Uh, what they're, what, what they're going to do is they're going to kill people. And, and they'll kill people in Western capitals. Um, we, we see a foreign policy disaster, really, of unprecedented dimensions. And the, the consequences of that disaster will be felt for years. We don't know what's going to happen. We don't know how any of this will play out, other than to say that Trump has unleashed vast quantities of human suffering, He has destabilized the most destabilized region in the world, and he has harmed deeply the national security interests of this country. I want to I want to sort of play devil's advocate for a moment on this. And I I actually believe it more than a devil's advocate. One thing as I've watched the criticism of this decision, I've thought to myself, I imagine a future in which, say, a Democratic president, even a Republican president withdraws from Afghanistan, something that I think has to happen at a certain point. We cannot be there forever. It is 18 years, the longest war in the Republic. And I worry, I guess, about the forms of argumentation being made here, being used there. We're abandoning our allies, the Afghan government. We fought beside these Afghan fighters. We are unleashing hell. The Taliban will rush back in. And I worry about essentially the same kinds of arguments being used then and and stopping and and promoting a war going on essentially forever. I think one thing is, is certainly likely to be true is that before the next presidential election, we will see the first American soldier, sailor, airman, or Marine who was born after 9-11 killed in action somewhere in the global war on terror that that day's events wrought. And so the idea that we should have a permanent garrison force for 20, 40, 50 years in Afghanistan, I profoundly disagree yeah. with. The idea that we can turn Afghanistan into a Jeffersonian democracy has always been a fool's errand. That being said, how we get out yeah. has to it's be the ha- the has to be as as with 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 care, with thought, um, and uh, frankly, uh, a lot greater thought than how we entered into some of these countries. It's, I think I think the how is a great point, and that's I think part of what's united people so much about this is is how insane the how was. I mean, I remember that Sunday night, all of a sudden. Twitter lights up and it's like, wait, the White House put out a statement on what they're doing. Like there's there's a sense in which you said this before that he's he's getting worse. You know, and I've, I've seen people say this since he came down the escalator. But um, I felt like the the Doral decision yesterday felt to me like kind, some kind of a break because of it. it is so egregious. It's indefensible. It is right. Like, how do you understand what he did yesterday with that? Oh, it's just extort extraordinary. I mean, they're they're like pigs feeding at the public trough. Um, it's it's this is this is what the emoluments clause in the Constitution directly speaks to. It's what it's there for. It's completely, utterly, indebatably, indisputably <laughs> unconstitutional. Yeah. It's a yeah. extraordinary <laughs> level of, of corruption. And and the and the brazenness of it is uh, really, at some level, it's you teeter between being outraged and sitting back and laughing. When Nick Mulvaney goes out, he says, no, he goes, absolutely. It's the best place <laughs> of all the places. <laughs> so it's face. the best one in all the land. Doral. <laughs> <laughs> 
There is also a sense in which, you know, I, there were all these stories in the beginning that I found sort of maddening, which were clearly, I think, coming from folks inside the administration of like, don't worry, I got, we got this. You know, there's a famous op-ed. But this idea of like, we're the guardrails, don't worry, we're keeping them checked. And I always found those really annoying and self-serving. That being said, it does seem to me the case that there are fewer internal guardrails now, that there were more people before who, for whatever reason, could distract him or push him off stuff than there are now. And that's why you're getting the Doral decisions. You're getting the insane reality show stunt he tried to pull with grieving parents whose child was killed. You're getting the Syria withdrawal. I thought the news conference in Ankara was just extraordinary with the vice president. It was like he was meatloaf from an Apprentice episode, yeah. you know, trying to please Mr. Trump, yeah. right, on the, on, the, on the charity candy show. Um, and the, the, uh, the sycophancy yeah. Ar- yeah. around him um, has led us, I think, to a, to a dangerous place. But now what we're seeing, I think, is a level of corruption that is so obvious, so deep, particularly with Ukraine. We'll start to see, I think, as facts come out, there is more nervousness on the Republican side than there has been heretofore. Um, Steve Schmidt, it's great to have you back. Good to be back. Thank you once again. Thank you for coming here tonight. Hey there, I'm Chris Hayes from MSNBC. Thanks for watching MSNBC on YouTube. If you want to keep up to date with the videos we're putting out, you can click subscribe just below me or click over on this list to see lots of other great videos.